All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out this afternoon and um, hearing about our study abroad trip to Bulgaria. We had the big reveal, right, I think <laughs> about this time last year, or no, it wasn't quite this time, but several months ago, the big reveal was to Peru, but as you'll hear, some things changed, and um, we, uh, we, the collective we, uh, GSW students went to Bulgaria instead, so they'll be sharing their experience um, about that trip. I just want to remind everyone that this is a Windows to the World event, and before the event started, I walked around and scanned some IDs and took some names. If I haven't gotten yours yet, I'll be here uh, afterwards, and we'll scan and get your name afterwards so you can get your Windows to the World credit. Um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and, and turn it over uh, to our faculty. We have, I'll introduce both of you. So we have Dr. Nelly Yordanova. Um, one of our um, esteemed in, uh, uh, faculty in chemistry, but really has led a number of study abroad trips for GSW to multiple countries, and so she has done a lot of work in, in study abroad. And Dr. Benjamin Metter uh, in exercise science. And, uh, and Dr. Metter, was this your leading your first study abroad trip? So this was his first, hopefully not his last. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so I would like to say thank you to both of them, and I'm going to uh, turn it over to them so they can introduce our, our speakers tonight who are our students who went on the trip. Thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, I'll just say thank you for everybody, and thank you everybody for coming tonight, and hopefully you will enjoy the presentations from the 10 students that came to Bulgaria. Yes, a little disappointing, we did not go to Peru, but I think they had a good time in Bulgaria, and we managed to stay overnight in Paris as well. So they will tell you all about their experience and trip. Our transition between people might not be the smoothest, but we're trying to keep it rolling. Can you use a microphone? That'd be not. That'd be great. Oh, gotcha. Hello. Okay. Hi, my name is Nikeria Smith, and I'm just going to talk about my Bulgarian experience. I know we we were supposed to like pick a theme and go with that. But I kind of had too much fun, and I didn't take no notes. So I'm just going to like talk about my experience and some of the things we did and like how I was impacted by it and the fun I had. <laughs> I can't hardly see. First, I want to talk about the when we, we visited the Rose Museum. Bulgaria is the world's second biggest exporter of rose oil and an ingredient in most perfumes. This museum is in the Skobel level village. I've never got the names. I couldn't get it right. I, we tried. I tried so hard. I'm sorry. I'm gonna get it wrong. The famous roll oil, of which Bulgaria is the world's largest producer, is extracted industrially by distillers, distillation, and widely used in the pharmaceutical and perfume industry. Okay, so when we visited. Um, the Rose Museum, we went into the distillery right here, and you'll be amazed how little oil comes out of these big, these big containers right here because it has to get distilled, and it used so many roses to make it happen. And, and like, they showed us this little tube, and like, it showed us ways to, um, to see if what's real and what's fake oil, and like, how it goes in um, perfumes, and like, I had kind of got some alcohol with the rose oil in it. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and so I like, but it's like how they use it for many different things. And I thought, thought that was really cool. And we went to eat here and I had like some, some great Bulgarian dishes. Like um, I, had, I had like fries with cheese on them. And then they had this great view right here and like steps and we was walking up the steps and stuff. So this was a, a really good way for us to see how they make the rose oil and one of the, the things that they produce the most. It was just awesome and I thought it was pretty cool. 
All right, this, is, this was in Sofia, and this is a, um, different pictures. When we went to, this is the first three pictures of, of, a, of a church, and it was um, the cathedral, the, Alan, the Alexander Nevsky Cathedral, and it's one of the largest Orthodox cathedrals in the world and was built between 1904 and 1912 to honor the Russian soldiers who died to liberate Bulgaria from the Ottoman rule. And this, the, the, the pictures don't do it justice. It was so beautiful. It took my breath away. And like, I, uh, we got a chance, I got a chance to light a candle. We couldn't touch anything. And I think we had to pay to take pictures. You can't just go in there and take pictures. They have to, we have to pay to take pictures. And they had a guard walking around, like, show me your, show me your ticket. Cause they really strict about that. And uh, me and, and uh, my partner over there, we kind of lit candles and prayed. And like, I thought that was cool. And they just like kind of wish for something that you would like and want, want to happen and stuff like that. So I did that and it, it was just cool. And we took some pictures. I really don't know who all these people are. They were just cool. And oh, there were saints, okay. This bread, y'all, was awesome. Like, that's one of the best bread I think I ever had in my life. It was like bread with feta cheese in it. And like, Banitsva? Banitsva. I still got it wrong? Let's cut that out, please. Okay. <laughs> All right, but that was like, it was like bread with feta cheese and it was like warm. And then we went into this like underground place to get it. And I felt real Bulgarian doing that. And it was just so awesome and it tasted really good. Y'all got to come up here next. Sorry, I like that. <laughs> the next place I want to talk about is Plotiv. Bulgaria. Plodiv is the oldest continuously inhabited city in Europe and one of the oldest cities in the world. The houses from the National Revival, Revival era are a symbol of the old town. Wealthy merchants that used to live there built them big like mansions. They used a lot of color and decoration. There are traces of ancient civilizations everywhere, which is so true because we went. Um, under this, this picture right here is, it was like, ro like Romans like a whole like Roman rocks, like it was a whole city built under that city. And we got to experience walking under there and seeing the culture and seeing things like, which I thought was like really, really cool. And that's what like, and it's like everywhere. And we went to a museum there as well, which would be a little later in the presentation. So that was, it's built more than 2000 years ago and it's still in use today, which they let us use and stuff like that, so. And there is the shopping street in the longest pedestrian zone in Europe. And I can tell you, it really was the longest pedestrian zone in Europe from one end to the next. My feet hurt very bad after that. But it, it was like so many shops and so many, and we did so many fun things and so many things to buy. And like, and like people were selling home, like home stuff like rose oil, honey, and like on the streets. And, it was just like nice to kind of see how they, li how the Bulgarians live and what, what was cool, what's cool to them. And I'm like, this is what they do every day. And it was like, just really, really nice. And we got to walk up these steps. Like these are the steps that lead to that picture right there. And that pic, like when I say the pictures don't do justice, it does not. Because we got to see like those, like, like I think they have like seven mountains and um, we got to, like, to see those up there, like that's like beyond that city. And this is actually a stage of where they um, did like plays and stuff. And, I, and then we all kind of did like a little song up there, but it was really nice. And these buildings are really beautiful. Like, the, like they said, the mansions and like, those are, were really beautiful pictures and not my best angle, but it was really nice. And I think we could, we tried to get into them, but they were closed. I think the blue one was closed when we tried to go and visit it. But. All right, Star Zagora. Throughout the centuries of the place have been governed by Thracians, Romans, Byzantines, Ottomans, and Bulgarians, respectively. Each of these civilizations played an important role in the development of the modern day Bulgarian city. Star Zagora, more than 8,000 years of history, 
It is one of the oldest continuously populated places in Europe. Okay, so we went into a museum and, and we went, I think this was like the third floor maybe, and we got to w just walk around, the, um, walk around this place and like see like the different civilization and then they'll point out and say, oh, this is where the stove was, oh, this is where the kitchen was, or this is where that was, and we all kind of, they had like a line where we could not cross, but we, we still, you know, got to experience and see those things, which I thought was pretty, pretty cool. And like to see the houses that were, st were stacked on top of each other right here, which we, I thought was cool from the, from the view. So. Food and beverages, one of my favorite things. Okay. <laughs> Rakia is an alcoholic drink with made from fermented pears, grapes, or apricot. It is Bulgaria's national drink and is usually consumed together with shapska, which is this picture right here. One sip will have you out. I, I thought I can take it like a champ. I couldn't. And one sip almost had me down. And this is like all the, the food we ate. Like it was like, the, we had a lot of like meat and it was like, I think it was like chicken and pork if I'm, chicken and pork. Hmm. Yes. And then it was like, oh, Eddie, ooh, is there? there we go. I did not know that would do that. So, and that, that was like our first dish, when we, like one of our first meals there. And it was like really good. And I enjoyed the flavors, very impactful and flavors. And I really liked it. And they had some awesome chicken soup. We had like, we enjoyed it the first time that I think we had like three versions of chicken soup after every day because it, it, was, it was really good. And then we had all like this, like two pizza restaurants we visited. That was really good. So I had a great time in Bulgaria. I laughed a lot and met great people. This trip was everything I hoped it will be except for Paris, which you will learn about later. And <laughs> I would definitely go back and enjoy this beautiful country. Alrighty. How y'all doing today? I will say this is the first time I've actually been on the mic side and not the camera side, so it is a nice change of pace. Uh, but my name is Travis. Um, I am going to be talking about the impact of the arts in Bulgaria. Uh, to first start out, I was going to talk a little bit about Bulgaria. Uh, so Bulgaria is a country that occupies the eastern side of the Balkan Peninsula in southeastern Europe. <clears throat> now it was founded during the 7th century, which makes it one of the oldest countries on the European continent. It is home to one of the oldest cities exist in the European continent, Sofia, which dates all the way back to the 5th century. Now there were many things that honestly interest me about this nation, uh, about this con ugh, sorry, <laughs> about this country. But honestly, the culture and experience in it was one of the best things. Uh, Bulgaria would be considered a cultural melting pot, uh, consisting of different cultures like Greek, Ottoman, Slavic, even Persian. Uh, throughout our trip, we experienced different cultural traditions and different forms of the arts while we were over there, two of which that I'll talk about is paintings and music. Uh, first one to start with paintings uh, is the first start, uh, first start with talking about the early art. Now, <clears throat> for the early start of Bulgarian traditions, uh, especially the arts, they were cut short due to the Ottoman occupation in the 14th century. At this point in time, many early masterpieces were destroyed, sadly. 
However, there began a national revival in the 19th century with native artistic life in Bulgaria. Among these influential works were the earthly and realistic paintings of Zahari Zograf in the first half and the second half being Hristo Sokev. Now, with the first half uh, being mainly centered around Zahara Zograf, he was mainly known for his church mural paintings, uh, including the famous Church of the Ria Monastery, shown in this picture here. I chose Church of the Ria Monastery because it was just the intricate detail in this mural, and you have to just think about the amount of time and effort that was put into all those intricate details that tells a story in itself. For the later half, though, of the 19th century, was with Heristo Sukhev, uh, who was mainly noted for his many portraits, uh, including one famous portrait depicting a girl in 1874. If you look in the picture, you can see the different types of clothing she wore, how her hair was put up, and honestly, looking back to these kind of portraits, you can see how life was a lot different. They wore different clothes, the styles were a lot bit different back then. It was a whole different life to, uh, to people overall. <clears throat> now, another painter that I wanted to talk about, while he was not known for portrait art or murals, he was definitely known for his cartoonish art, which was Donio Donev. Uh, Donio was loved by numerous generations of Bulgarians for his memorable and funny cartoons. One of which he is famously known for uh, is Tramata Glupatsi, or The Three Fools. Uh, his clever ideas left such an impact on the art, and it honestly just it became iconic especially for uh, gently criticizing the Bulgarian society's peculiarities. Uh, but while we were over there, we also noticed a lot of the street art that was present. Now, nowadays street art has become more popular in Bulgaria, uh, and you would either find something, uh, a painting on the wall of a building, or some sort of sculpture set out in front of a business. Now, uh, this specific example we found here was part of a project called Plovdiv, Ancient and Eternal. This was started with a company in Plovdiv called Bullmint, uh, which did this to introduce their first issue of collectible metals they had released in collaboration with the Plovdiv 2019 Foundation, uh, which commemorated the cultural and historical landmarks that have become symbols of the city. Now, in these part of it. You can see the stage that uh, my classmate had talked about earlier that we had went to. And uh, as well as this was some of the uh, stonework of the original uh, streets. Now, I'm not going to lie with you. Your feet will hurt walking down that street, 100%. Uh, it, it, it was, we walked for days and days on end but it was honestly really worth it seeing these structures, seeing this, you know, still in life, showing what used to be the past of Bulgaria. Uh, but to move on, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the arts, uh, specifically music. Um, and I'm going to talk with the first performances of Bulgarian classical music, which, although it was mus uh, originally from the 1890s, the earliest Bulgarian opera was actually performed in the 1900s by Emanuel Manolov. Now, he, him, yeah, sorry, he as well as other Bulgarian composers concentrated on both choral and vo uh, solo vocal works. Now, one piece that Emanuel was known for was Sidro Makinia, as well as another piece um, known as What a Girl I Saw Mama being translated. Uh, <clears throat> now, to forward time to now modern day, uh, in today's music industry, we find a variety of artists emerging from all sorts of genres. A lot of these artists are becoming popular in Bulgaria due to the ability of possessing 
the ability to blend traditional Bulgarian music with music of nowadays. Uh, but luckily, many of their traditional songs are also played throughout the country still. Uh, this performance that we're about to play in a second was actually held in the middle of the plaza in, uh, in Plovdiv. Uh, I had to use, can you click on it for me? Uh, bottom left corner of the picture. <laughs> Now, part of the celebration was actually held uh, for the beginning of spring. Now, one thing I will say with that, uh, to show how different it is over there in Bulgaria compared to now, if you saw people dancing in a plaza, how many of you are just going to join in? Okay, so we have a few hands, right? If uh, while this performance was going on, people that were just doing their normal daily lives, walking to and from, maybe had to go somewhere, to see some, they would just join in. It was so normal just to feel free to just join and have fun over there in Bulgaria. And that was honestly one of the things that I loved so much about it. It was just, it was so free, it was so welcoming. <clears throat> now, I want to talk about uh, what did I learn on my trip. When I went on this trip, I realized I had taken a lot from the different cultures that was uh, consisting in this melting pot. But, <clears throat> I learned a lot through the different people that I met. One specific day when we went on this trip, uh, I think it was the second day in Plovdiv, uh, second or third day, we had a free day. And through that entire day, I spent going to different shops, talking to different people, and getting to know some uh, the really, really nice people there. I went to this one hot, shop, uh, hot sauce shop, talked with the guy for hours there, and me and him still message each other. We still chat, keep up in touch. He lets me know how his distance been and everything, and we, we enjoyed each other's company then, and we still keep in, and keep in contact now. And I remember there were some people on our trip that would go, I wish I could have stayed here longer. I could have wished that this place. I hated that we couldn't go back to this other place, <laughs> a certain location. But even though we had all that, the memories that we made when we were over there definitely helped us get a better understanding, or at least for me-wise, I would think, the other people here would agree the same way, that we took something from this trip and definitely have a better depth of how diverse the world truly is. In conclusion, I hope you have learned a lot about Bulgaria. <laughs> uh, the world is a giant, uh, if I can have three things to remember, the world is a giant place with places to explore, people to meet, and memories to be made. So if you have the chance to explore, take the leap. Try study abroad. You may take something more than what you think. And lastly, we also got to go to Paris for a night. And if you want to know the crazy story about our experiences with the France airport, talk to us afterwards. It's a doozy. <laughs> and that's it. Huh? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Hi. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, uh, this, I want to tell everybody about my study abroad trip. Um, we went to Bulgaria, which definitely wasn't part of the plan originally, um, but it ended up being a great thing anyway. Um, I just wanted to 
quickly mention this little quote right here. I am not going to upset the Bulgarians by like even trying to pronounce it, but it means that a person, I want to say it's literally translated to, a person who learns will succeed. <clears throat> and then I just added this quote too, just for anybody interested in studying abroad. Um, as, a person who's <laughs> as a person who's never been out of the country, the thought of studying abroad with strangers was absolutely terrifying. Um, I decided to join the trip because it was a lot cheaper than the other ones I had seen advertised. Um, like I said, like everybody else has said, um, we initially planned on going to Peru, but due to their own political environment, it was considered unsafe. So after months and months of Dr. Yordnova and Dr. Metter working tirelessly to find a new destination, we finally settled on Bulgaria. I decided to roll with the punches because it was still an opportunity to see the world, and I'm so excited that I did. Um, we stopped in several cities throughout Bulgaria, big and small, and explored places that I never knew existed. <clears throat> As a history major, I decided to do my project over the history of roses in Bulgaria. Um, roses are central to Bulgarian culture, and they can be seen everywhere, every street corner, museums dedicated to them, all religious garments, anything. Um, the country is responsible for over 70% of the world's oil production and uh, prices for this are as high as gold. With only a two to three month window for production, growers hand pick each rose and treat each one with all the care that they need throughout the entire, or entire extraction process. Um, during our trip, we went to several museums, um, one of which was the Damascena Museum, solely dedicated to roses and rose production, like the one Nikeria shared in her pictures. Um, but just even seeing that museum and being in there and seeing how elegant it was compared to a lot of the things that we saw in the country, it really showed or like emphasized how important that, that flower is to the country itself, both culturally and economically. And these are just a couple pictures of shops and then the Rose Queen at the Rose Museum. And like I said, it's literally all throughout their culture. It's everywhere. <clears throat> Let me tell you about Paris. Um, on our way to Bulgaria, we arrived late from New York to Paris and um, just so happened to miss our connecting flight to Sofia. Um, at first, I was very excited about this. <laughs> um, but after many hours in an extremely tense airport, Delta was kind enough to give us rooms um, in the nearby hotel for the night, which very hard to find. We, there were six hotels probably with the same name and we probably went to five before we showed up to the one that was ours. Um, but regardless, um, although Paris was becoming increasingly, or increasingly tense politically with all the riots and stuff everybody may know about, um, we were able to explore the central part of Paris's downtown area. Um, as my first real night, out of my home country. The excitement was unreal and I couldn't believe I was standing right next to the Eiffel Tower. Um, we ate French food and dove headfirst into European culture by walking around in 30 degree rainy weather, which I feel like is necessary if you end up going there. But overall, it was really cool. I'm not gonna hate on Paris. Um, <clears throat> Once in Bulgaria, our study abroad experience truly began and we started moving nonstop throughout the country. Our tour guides were an absolute pleasure, and as you moved around the city, you could see how the country has changed over time. Their rich, history, their rich history stretched all the way from the Paleolithic period to their current democratic market economy. As a country that's been burnt and rebuilt over and over again, each building revealed this time period and offered a closer look into Bulgarian culture. We tried new food and drinks, socialized with locals, explored every second we were able to, and took in as much history as possible. One major event that took place on March 1st is the Rose Festival. <clears throat> um, sorry, I'll, I'll pause on the Rose Festival. These are just some of our foods that we ate. Um, this was a tomato. Bulgaria has the best feta cheese I've ever had in my life. If you ever get around some or get the chance to get some, I promise, do it. And then the same soup bowl that, or meat bowl that we had. And the benitsa, love the benitsa, would die for benitsa. Everybody needs to try it. All right, so like as I was saying, um, March 1st um, begins the Rose Festival. Um, upon arrival, each of us were given a martinitsi, 
which is, I don't know if you can really see it right now. It's a tiny little bracelet. We each got a couple of them. And um, I brought the dolls too. You probably can't see them since everybody's way far away, but they're made out of these little like dolls and it's a man and a woman. <clears throat> and this is like a really big holiday in Bulgaria. People are celebrating spring coming and when you see flowers blooming, you take your marnitsi off and you hang it on the bloom. So all around Bulgaria, we saw like these beautiful trees or flowers starting to bloom and then you could just see them completely full of these bracelets and people were sharing them and it was honestly like a really cool way for everybody to get connected. And I just thought it was really beautiful. <clears throat> so I have a video. Not sure. This is just like it on the trees. Very pretty. And definitely like a weird experience if you've never heard any or seen anything like it, but I thought it was absolutely beautiful. Different than what I've seen in my life and just seeing them everywhere, it's really cool. <clears throat> and then here are just more pictures, like I said. Um, their history is in super rich. I was completely overwhelmed the entire time. I was stimulated my history brain, but everywhere you were, there was ruins. You're standing on cities that are thousands of years old. You could tell time period just moving down the street. Even the H&M had ruins in the bottom of it, and which was so crazy. I wish I would have included the picture, but I didn't take one. Google it. Um, but anyway, I learned so much on my trip, and I'm so happy that I decided to tag along. The strangers that I was traveling with quickly became my friends, and it was wonderful to have this experience with them. Together we gained new perspective, joyful memories, and maybe a slight disdain for the airport in France. We met the coolest people, went from big cities to tiny villages, and we will always share this once in a lifetime experience. Overall, studying abroad in Bulgaria changed how I see cultures that are different from mine and offered, a sense, offered me a sense of unity that I've never felt in America. As Travis was explaining when everybody was joining dancing, that was probably one of the coolest experiences I've ever had in my life. As a person who's like, used to live outside of Vegas, and I've seen people dancing in the street, but it's not something I would ever join in on. <laughs> it was very nice to see people so culturally connected and bonded together, and they just welcomed us in like no problem, even if they hadn't ever met a tourist or spoke any English. Everybody was extremely nice. Um, the Bulgarian people are so connected and take every chance they have to celebrate their culture and heritage, and I can't express how lucky I am to have felt like a part of it. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Yordnova, for being our near constant translator. I'm sure you had several migraines. And thank you so much, Dr. Metter, for making sure Dr. Yordnova didn't combust and also <laughs> having several migraines. And um, I'm really excited that I went. And if anybody's interested in study abroad, I highly, I highly, highly recommend that you go and especially go with these two guys. So, anyway, that is it. Um, so as you can see, I also went to Bulgaria to study abroad, just like all these other lovely folks. Um, so these are just some cool pictures that I took. Um, this is a random tractor on the side of the road, and I just was like, man, that's picture worthy. You never know when you're going to see that again. Um, so I just wanted to talk about some of the cities that we visited. Um, these are a few of the bigger cities, Sofia, Plovdiv, Stara Zagora, and Veliko Ternovo. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's little stars at where we went. So we traveled a good bit of the country. Um, we just experienced everything that, well, most everything that Bulgaria had to offer. Um, and so this picture at the top is a castle that's actually in Veliko Ternovo, which was once their capital of Bulgaria. So I just thought that was really neat. And just a cool piece of history. Not many people can say, I've been to a castle in Bulgaria. Um, so that was really neat. And then I, the main point of my presentation is Plovdiv. Plovdiv was my favorite city that we visited. It had a lot of history and culture and just a lot of cool things that I found interesting. Um, so first, some just a little bit of information about Plovdiv. It's the second largest city in Bulgaria. It's known as the City of the Seven Hills. And trust me, we walked a couple of them. Um, it's also known as Philopolis. 
Philopolis. That's when it was um, controlled by the Romans. That's what they named their towns were always polis, was at the end of all of their towns. And then it's known as the capital of culture. In 2019, they were awarded that by um, the European, some organization in Europe. I can't remember off the top of my head. And then this picture at the bottom is an example of their pedestrian streets. I thought that was very interesting. All of the cities that we went to, they had a main pedestrian walkway. There was no cars. And I just thought it was really neat that you could just stroll through the town. And that's not something we have here. We have downtowns, but there's still a chance you could get run over by a car. Here, you can't get run over by a car, at least in this area. Um, so a part of the history, they had an ancient um, Roman theater. So at the bottom of the theater, if you can see the levels, that represents hell. The middle layer is reality, and the top layer is heaven. So whenever they are doing their Greek tragedies or whatever place that is going on at the time, that's how they would, um, that's where they were on the stage. And so we got to visit that. And then this is a church in Plovdiv. Um, there's a rich history of early Christian um, early Christians just being established there. They have records of St. Paul coming to baptize people there. And I thought that was really neat because not many people could say, you know, I've walked where the early Christians have walked or I've walked where the ancient Greeks have walked. And one big character um, that they have in their culture is Orpheus. So many people might recognize the name Orpheus from Greek history but or mythology, but for the Bulgarians, Orpheus is not just a myth. He was a real person who um, was really good, like, singer and really good with music. And so he is one of their main, like, people that they remember in their town. And then also they were taken over by the Ottomans, and the Ottoman Turks took over <laughs> Bulgaria. And so in Plovdiv, where there was a large Christian culture, they had to build mosque because the Ottoman Turks were Muslim. So you'll see um, this is a mosque and the rest, and this is the back of the mosque. It has a character hidden um, that the Bulgarian builders built the mosque. The Bulgarian Christian builders built the mosque. So they decided they were going to hide a symbol in the back that said Christ is alive. And so I thought that was really neat how you can always go around the rules and laws of the people that are in charge. And then another example of that are the buildings, the other two pictures. Um, there were laws that said you can't like build a church, so they would build a house, and on the inside it was a church. And then there were laws where you can't see it from eye level of the street, so they built walls. And I just thought that was really cool how you can like circumvent the ruling laws that had taken over. Um, so cuisine, we had a lot of good food. Um, we kind of already touched on that a little bit, but a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables, um, a lot of Bulgarian cheese, which was delicious, and a lot of chicken soup, which was also delicious. <laughs> um, and then we had, they had these cool espresso machines, which you would just walk down the street and boom, there's espresso. It costs like 50 cent to get one. So of course, you know, I got one. Um, and I would protest to have one of these on campus because it was great, they were everywhere. And then, yeah, there was a restaurant called Happy. This is a picture of what we would have at Happy. It was kind of like a chain restaurant, um, but it, it was kind of funny. They brand, they have their brand all over Bulgaria, so everywhere you go, it would be like, Happy this, Happy that. And so I just thought that was kind of neat. Um, and then the culture of Plovdiv, their like motto loosely translated is trying hard to do nothing. And I was like, yes, sir, I can get on board with that. Um, so you'll really just see people strolling the streets. They're not in a hurry. They're not worried about getting places like on time. They eat when they eat with their friends. They eat for hours. They don't rush like we do in America. Um, they have, yeah, they drink coffee for hours and hours. And they just fellowship with the people around them. And I thought that was like something that we could adopt here in America. And then here's just some more pictures. Um, the over on the left, there's an example of the Roman ruins at the bottom. So you have history and then you have modernity on top. So that is underneath the walkway that we walked it, back and forth. Anywhere we wanted to go, that was the walkway you walked. It was right on top of Roman ruins. Um, 
yeah, there you go, Plovdiv. Hello, I'm Michaela Chavez, and I'm a pre-nursing major. So I did my project on the smoking culture in Bulgaria. Um, going to Bulgaria, one of the things I noticed was how frequent they smoked there, and how for smoking for them wasn't just a stress reliever, but it was also sort of like a social outlet for them. So it was very common for people to like go out, get coffee, have drinks with their friends, and smoke. And a survey done in December of 2020 actually showed that Bulgarians who identified as smokers reported having more social interaction than those who reported as non-smokers. Um, there, they don't categorize e-cigarettes and vapes in the same category as they do regular tobacco products. So while you may be able to vape in certain areas, you wouldn't necessarily be able to smoke there. And then smoking among the youth, a lot of the data and the research I found pertaining to smoking included um, ages from 15 up, but they also did have research regarding younger ages among the youth. And also a lot of times smoking among youth relates back to their financial situation or rather the financial situation of their parent or guardian. And then smoking regulations, when doing my research, I was very shocked to find out that Bulgaria has one of the strictest smoking regulations in the European Union. And I was very shocked because like I said, we saw people smoking frequently. If you can see in that picture down there in the corner, there's a woman like literally smoking inside of the restaurant. And a lot of the restaurants we went to, they'd have like ashtrays out on the table for you to like smoke in there. But I feel like part of that is due to the fact that even though they do have the strict Regulations are not strongly enforced because in our total of eight or nine days being there, we only saw three police officers and two of them were just monitoring like highway traffic. So they weren't going around and like strictly enforcing things like this. So honestly, it's up to the owner of the establishment if you can really smoke in there or not. So. And then the effects of smoking, lung cancer is the third leading cause of death there. So it does have an impact on them, but their life expectancy isn't as low as one might think it to be. And I think that's because they have a healthy balance. So while yes, they are smoking, their diet and exercise is really good because as you've heard about the pedestrian walks, they walk practically everywhere and it is not an easy walk. Some of those hills are really steep. And then also their diet, all the food there is fresh, the diet's well balanced. They had plenty of fruit and vegetable stands everywhere. And I remember the first night, the little appetizer we had, it had a tomato base and everyone was talking about how fresh and delicious it was and how it was like the best tomato they've ever had in their life. And then smoking prevention, they do have cheap alternatives to smoking, which works for them. That way everyone there who did who would want to stop smoking has the ability to because they have access to something that will help them stop smoking compared to in the US or how developed countries where we do have nicotine patches and there is the Pfizer pill, but the nicotine patches are running you $100 for an eight week supply and then you're paying $300 for a 12 week supply of the Pfizer pill. And I feel like that's helpful because they do have access to that. But going back to the fact that it is a social outlet for them, I think that's where most of the difficulty comes from quitting for them because it's not just I have to turn to something else to relieve my stress. You're used to going out on Fridays, getting a drink and smoking with your friends, and now you're removing that social aspect from your life. And here's some more. There's just a collage of smoking related. But I don't want to make it seem like it was all bad or that it like deterred my experience on the trip and made it any less and that there was like smoke being blown in my face 24 seven because that wasn't the case. I had a lot of fun. I think Bulgaria was a lot of fun. I'm glad we ended up going to Bulgaria. And it had basically everything for everyone. I'm a big foodie, so I enjoyed that. They had tons of history. The culture was really cool, the artwork. So it was a great trip, and if you ever have the chance to go on a study abroad trip, I highly encourage it.
How's everybody doing? Um, my name is Kaelin Barkley. I'm a senior here, graduating Friday. Uh, and uh, <laughs> um, this is my second study abroad trip, and um, I really enjoyed it. I'm going to talk about what everybody likes, and that's food. All right, so I compared the Bulgarian cuisine to the American cuisine. Um, all right, so the Bulgarian cuisine is a heavy influence of the Balkan and Mediterranean flavor with an emphasis on fresh, in fresh ingredients, spices, and herbs. Some popular dishes in Bulgaria include Dr. Shopska salad. And the thing, um, I forgot who said this, uh, with the Bulgarian, and not just Bulgarian, a lot of the countries, they are big advocates of fresh. And I think that's the key to like health. I, I mean, not to say that the US is not doing that, but most of the other countries are big, big on um, fresh food. This was the first thing we ate. Um, forgot who had this lot, but the feta cheese and tomato, it was kind of different, but it was good. Uh, the second one is, oh, yeah, uh, <laughs> that was a soup, and I have a picture of that. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Um, but it's the cold soup made with yogurt, uh, cumbers, and garlic, and dill. Uh, third one? You try it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kabacha, uh, grilled mice and meat, often served with a side of fries and salad. We actually have that and the bonnets. That was the um, the main thing we ate up there. That was pretty good. It's pretty good. Okay, we want to talk. Does anybody know what this is a picture of? From where? Monroe's. All right. On the other hand, uh, American cuisine is known for its diversity and religious region vary. Some popular American dishes include hamburgers, hot dogs, barbecue, and pizza. Of course, we know a lot of this stuff is not good for us, but it's convenient and uh, it's cheap. All right. Uh, does anyone know the number one cause of death in the U.S.? Yeah, heart disease. And of course, a lot of the um, food, fast food and different stuff that we eat comes from that. Of course, we need to exercise, but like they say, you are what you eat. Um, this is a video, but it's, it's not playing. Um, yeah. Okay, this is... Um, some soup and salad. And like I said, the thing about over there, it was um, a lot of fresh food, and that was good. I'm big on trying different stuff. Um, one of the things that I do is when I go out of, just out of America's, I never eat, I'm sorry, I never eat anything that I can eat back at home. So like if I go to, does it say Columbus, I'm not gonna eat a Chick-fil-A. I'm gonna try something that we don't have back at home. And definitely, um, the food that we ate over there was different. Some more stuff, I think it was cheese bites, uh, fish. And the thing with the US, we're big on salt and sugar. That That's what kind of takes us down. Um, I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of people uh, my major is long-term care management, and a lot of older people, they suffer from dementia and diabetes, and that comes from sugar. I mean, that's why it's, it's good to eat fresh and and just watch what we eat. Again, that's that um, the meat with the fries and the tomatoes. I think that meat had like cheese in it or something. Yeah, yeah it's pretty good. Pretty good. And this was a. Uh, um, Chicken finger salad, that was good as well. Like I say, the food is way different. You know, a lot of times when I was younger, I used to eat till I get to that stage where I'm miserable and bloated, and uh, that wasn't good. So, you know, we're supposed to eat for nourishment in our body. 
to a couple of, um, we went out and um, ate it. There's a couple of things, I think we have the bunny um, right there, the bread. And the bread is even different um, over there. You know, a lot of the bread that we eat over here, like I said, it makes you feel miserable and bloated. But um, the bread there was pretty good. Some bread right there, grilled sausages and stuff like that. More food. I mean, we didn't lack any food over there, I'll tell you that. <laughs> we were eating like three meals a day, so. All right. Um, Don't forget, lunch was a three-course meal. Do you remember? Soup, main, yeah. and dessert. So it wasn't three meals a day, but also three Yeah, three-course meal, yeah. So we had plenty of food. Um, overall, the Bulgarian cuisines tend to be lighter and more vegetable based, while American cuisine is often heavy and meat, meaty. However, both cuisines have their own unique flavor and dish that are worth trying. And if you eat Bulgarian food, this is what it makes you do. Could you play that for me? <laughs> Everybody watch. Go. <laughs> But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but overall, it was a great trip. I think that everybody, I mean, if you get the chance, you should try it because just going to a different country is awesome, I think. Thank you. Oh, no. oh, sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm Alyssa Ogden, and I am doing my MSN and nursing now. There you make it this. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I did mine, I guess you can see, on Fresh Markets, and I wanted to go after Keelan or him go after me because um, we both talked about food, and you can tell we like food. So, um, as he said, the taste of everything was um, so different there in the food and I think it's because of the freshness of it so I started looking at the markets and you can go to the next slide and I um, started noticing the vegetables and the fruits and all whenever um, when it came to the traditional Bulgarian markets they had a lot to offer every place I looked um, I mean it just everything was fresh they didn't and they had more of a selection, like we go to Walmart and we don't get to see a lot of the stuff that they have to me that um, they just had a better looking, um, I guess I lose this, huh? a better, they had a better variety. Um, and as who said about the tomatoes, it was you a while ago that said, we said these tomatoes are so good. I said, I have lived in South Georgia all of my life and I have never had tomatoes that were as good as they were there. They were just, it was a, a different taste for them. They are the leading exporter of grapes and tomatoes. And um, they're, they said that their garden just wouldn't be complete without the pink tomatoes. And they, they had a different color to them. But they also, when you cut them open, they just, they didn't have, some of ours don't have like a core in them, but they had the core and everything. I don't know what variety of tomatoes they were, but they were really good. And, you know, every salad that we had there, they had tomatoes. They had less lettuce to me than what we have here but they would have like the feta cheese and the tomatoes. And one morning I even ate cucumbers and tomatoes for breakfast. And I was like, I've never ate this in my life. Um, the limes that I noticed there, um, they export a good bit of limes from what I can find on that. And they also export a lot of, um, it said lime honey 
was something that I found in there that they do a um, good bit of export. And so not only are they, you know, they're having a lot for them, but they're keeping it, you know, to export as well. So they somebody's got some big land somewhere. I, we didn't get to go by, I guess, a big garden that I remember seeing or a big farm. But, um, I mean, we saw a few, and especially like that, the rose place was really big. But um, they have the fresh spices, and they were in the markets as well. And it they were... Pretty much like stuff like you could see here, which was parsley, cumin, thyme, and bay leaf. But they had, again, it was just the freshness of it. They would have it like, you know, with your dish or something. And it just, it made the taste better. And like he said, you wouldn't salt and everything as much because you had more of the fresh spices to it. Um, the grapes. The grapes I noticed, and that was used for the, how do, how do y'all say that? The ra, rakia, yeah. I noticed the grapes everywhere, and everybody loved the rakia. I could tell that that was um, a big deal. And there was, um, a, a lot of people had grape vines even at their house, but then you could see fields of grapes and things. We did pass a good bit of those to me. Um still back to the freshness of it and every meal that we had it had you know garlic and different things to it that just gave it that extra oomph to the food as Keelan said it was um special that they had all that um the organic vegetables the radishes um it just seems like the fruits and every meal that they had it was prepared fresh that they had extra color, you know, that they had with each meal. They just seem to give every, they give a lot into doing their mar their market. And every, like when we would go down to the city and you could see the markets there, there was typically a little lady there that we would talk to and I could ask her the price of something. And I was even amazed at how they could speak English. They could tell you how, you know, how many lebs it cost or whatever, because you would, you know, ask the price of whatever. And they they do really well with, you know, just speaking English with everybody asking how much things were in the market. You wouldn't think that some of the people to look at them, I thought, oh, they're probably not going to know English, and they would just rattle on with you. Um, like I said, that was some more market fresh. Um, the plums. I think they make the rakia with that as well. Well, I, I have to be honest with you. Those are imported plums. Not the, the plums in Bulgaria are longer and smaller. They're not this round. Okay. Well, those I found them at the market, but I guess. Yeah. Um, said you can indulge without spending a fortune. So they had colorful markets. Um, the kiwi, it said that the kiwi was there like from October to early spring, I think, or something. That they were, I don't know where the kiwi were there. It comes from Greece, actually. Okay. Or from the southern part of Bulgaria. Yeah, it did, yeah. The Shopska salad is a must when you're in Bulgaria. And then I saw the red peppers there, and I had noticed that they had those on our salad when we were there. And like I said, it was real colorful with the cucumbers and the everything and the cheese on top. And I'm just like everybody else, try the feta cheese when you get there. Go ahead and look it up. Um, I don't know about the apples that were there If as far as um, where they were from and all. You can find exotic fruits, you know, the kiwi and everything. Um, the plums, I guess, and grapes, the watermelons and melons. They they had a lot of raspberry, and they had some lemonade and stuff with like a, a raspberry something to it. And 
it was really good. And like I said, they made everything so colorful and fresh, and you could tell it was fresh squeezed lemonade that we had with that. I would recommend the food there, and I would recommend trying the markets and just to see um, what you could find there. They Just because you buy the seasonal fruits, they're, not only are they cheaper at some of the places, but they have more vitamins in them. And like he said, it's a lot of the food we eat here. I think we're not doing as many vitamins, and they have, like I said, I don't really even eat raspberries at home, but I eat them there. And um, I think the soil was a big reason that they have that and um, just the organic farming into a thriving business model. I would recommend if anybody gets a chance to go, that you go and try, try to eat everything you can there because it was wonderful. Seriously, all they have is a counter, and then it's like 
you know, people in the back, maybe two or three seats open. I was like, what the heck? <laughs> That's why I don't go in there. And they have donuts. <laughs> I, I've never seen McDonald's have donuts, like seriously. Um, then they have Happy Meal display. They care about their kids. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so some more advertising. Everywhere we went, uh, I just saw McDonald's sign. Right here, Milka and Kit Kat. Who, like, have you been to a McDonald's where chocolate, like, it's so much chocolate? Seriously. They have chocolate cake, they have um, chocolate pie, they have cheesecake. Um, like I said, they have that, the chocolate muffin and then Kit Kat ice cream. They have, I think it was like 15 different um, varieties of coffee. Like, jeez. Um, and then right here, they put, well, of course, you know, it's McDonald's, so they're going to put their signs as visible as they can. It's on, on the but it was one building um, that we passed, and it was a McDonald's, like just a big animal right on top of the building. Um, I thought it was this building right here. Maybe so. Yeah, but yep, that that was cool. Uh, okay, so KFC, same with KFC, like. Oh, well, that's not part of KFC, but still, it's still outside in front of KFC. Um, look, Ben and Jerry's ice cream in KFC. This is not a joke, people. <laughs> no, this is serious. This is serious. Like, what the heck? They have never offered that in America. Gosh. Donuts, uh, brownie. Um, I'm trying to see. They have, a, they have a vegan menu, like a full vegan menu. Goodness. Subway. Subway, it was, um, oh, and I do want to say that McDonald's, there's a, that, that is, of course, it's the largest um, quick service restaurant chain in Bulgaria. And um, KFC, there's 29 locations, and I think majority of them are in Sofia. So like I said, that's where they put most of their locations in, um, in Sofia. This popular destination. Subway, there are 31 locations, and they try to put their subway close to schools because they want um, children to come to them after school. So, this is HM. We went into HM and it had four floors. So, I'm standing on the, well, it had five floors, but I don't know what the fifth floor was, but what this was the fourth. So third, second, first, and then right here is the ruins. But um, each floor was dedicated to you know, gender. So the first two floors were women, then the second floor was kids, but then the, or no, not the second, the third floor was kids, and then the fourth floor was men. And I've never, I've never seen um, their, new, their new brand move. So when we went in there, and I went to the men's section, it was like the whole side, whole half side was just H&M move. And I was like, what the heck? And actually, I went to the mall um, Saturday, and I finally saw it. But I was like, this is nothing compared to Bulgaria. Like, yeah. <laughs> and um, I've been in one H&M in Atlanta, and it has two floors, that's it. So, but this is, I can't remember where this one, where this H&M was. But this one was in Plavdiv, and then this one is in Sofia, the mall. So Rafi's, um, oh man, the gelato was amazing. Um, this is a franchise. They, their main goal is to create comfiness and um, just like a, fr a real friendly environment because their target market is young people, like students, uh, mainly college students really. And what I didn't know was up here is an actual um, a, a club. So, you know, you eat ice cream down here, or you just sit and chill down here, and then late at night, you come up here. I think it's open to like 2 a.m. I, I can't really remember, but yeah, I thought that was cool. Like, they, most, of their, um, most of their locations have a 
upper level for the for the club. Um, it's one of the fastest growing restaurant brands in Bulgaria. And oh yeah. Actually they um also just like the on the next slide that I'm about to show you, they expect most of their um their visitors to be tourists. So that's why they that's why they, the inside of their um locations are so how do I say um comfortable actually like like they have uh what do you Bean bag chairs, or not bean bag chairs, but those little little leather chairs and just rolling around in them. Like it, it was actually really cool. I've never been in a shop or any restaurant or anything like that with that had that. So I, I like the way that every every restaurant really it was comfortable. Like I didn't feel like oh I don't want to be here or you know I, I was never even cold in a restaurant. And here in America, I'm cold in every restaurant. <laughs> Okay, so this is happy. And the first thing that I noticed when I looked out the window when we landed in Bulgaria was happy. It was on the side of an airplane. And everywhere, like, this is on the uh, little ramps or whatever they're called. I think these are three different ones. Um, and then this right here, this is when you're walking down the ramp to get on the plane, is on all the walls. Happy, happy, happy. Oh, yeah, I'm happy, all right. <laughs> as, as we're driving, and then you see right here, right on top of the building, and Sophia, this is a Coca-Cola. This was the menu. This is what I had because I'm vegan. And here it is again. Oh. Happy, happy, happy. And these are all the locations, actually. Um, it's located in Bulgaria, Spain, and the UK. And it is actually, there. this is the other franchise that they expect half of their uh, business to come from tourists. But they don't, their menu is actually catered to Bulgarians in a way, it's authentic. Um, so they, they don't just, it's not just Bulgarian food, but it's around them, about, around Bulgarians because they want to show tourists their culture. And they're constantly changing their um, their themes or the inside the inside of their restaurants, period, uh, just to just to match the environment and what's going on what's going on um, in the cities actually. So I think uh, it said that in different cities they look differently inside just to match what's going on around on the outside. But yeah this was had it was good. <laughs> um, so I don't know how to pronounce this, Bayside, I don't know, but um, they're actually known for their baklava, it's a Turkish franchise, and um, I think this was, this was uh, located in Star Sabora, but they have more in Sofia. Um, yeah, they, but they, we had gelato here actually, it was good though, um, and that this is, well, no, Sofia is their main location. Okay, so you can't see this, is good. look, we was moving really fast, so, <laughs> but the, um, I'm trying to show you Hesburgh, the franchise, and it's actually um, based in Finland, and it operates in the Ukraine, Germany, and in Bulgaria. There, there are 22 locations in Bulgaria, um, and six in Sofia. So like I said, Sofia is a popular destination. So most of these places, they're going to have majority of their locations in Sofia. Um, and it is, apparently, is the European competitor to McDonald's. OK. <laughs> um, this is little. I wasn't able to go inside, but um, it was interesting because, oh crap, oh now I know what that is. Um, this is here in Georgia too. It's not that many, but I haven't seen that many. I've seen like one or two, but yes. Um, and I think they said it was kind of like, not really, but kind of the equivalent to a Walmart. So, yeah. 
Oh, okay. Um, before I end it, I want to say some some things that I found interesting. Uh, basement shops. Oh, those are cool. Like you walk in, and then right down here is a window, and then it has like products like um, cigarettes or drinks or um, what do we see? Belts, st stuff like that, like leather goods, just at your knees. And all you have to do is bend down and say, "Hey, like, can I get this?" You know, and that. <laughs> It was cool. Another thing that we saw was coffee vending machines. Oh my gosh, like it had um, coffee with orange juice, apple juice, but um, it was like between what, 10, 10 cents or 10, um, yeah, to about two level. So that was cool. And um, let's see. There was one more thing. Basement shops, copy vending machine. It was one more thing, but really, I learned that America sucks. Like, <laughs> we had to do better because, like, everything, everything Bulgaria had. I'm like, oh gosh, like, if we had this, and they really care about their customers. Like, franchises really, yeah, you know they. It's about the food, but they really care about their customers. They try to make the environment as comfortable as they can. I've never felt comfortable in a restaurant in America. I don't know about y'all, but in Bulgaria, I, I could stay for hours and sit. Oh, the, the igloos, the little igloos outside of the restaurants. Yo, that was cool. Like, you you know, you could drink, smoke, talk to your friends, stuff like that. And um, it was cold, so. You don't want to sit outside at nighttime, but when you sit in there, it has like a heater and everything. They, they should do that here in America. <laughs> so we went to three major cities and then two villages. So our major cities are in of Sofia, Fondo, and Sara Zagora. We also went to two more smaller cities, so we have Carlo Pack. And then So I'm just going to touch on a little bit of the architecture that we found. And then they also showed us historical landmarks and actually how well they're preserved. And in the United States, we don't really preserve our architecture that well or things that we find. And then just the importance of the different styles. So I started off with Sofia, which is this is when we first came. And <coughs> this is the pedestrian zone, and it is modern architecture first come in and then you have like the ice cream shop that's modern they're trying to attract the kids but then you have buildings like this that have been there for half of a century so this is a government building here and you can see the importance of the columns which is dating back to their um, Roman rule and then this is beneath Sophia so um, so this is beneath the pedestrian walkway we have actual old Trojan run, like ruins, and this is their actual city kind of as well. So you can come and see like how well preserved it is. Like this is just underneath, and some of them they have lines to show like what they rebuilt just to give you an idea of what these buildings used to look like. And then you can see how they preserve some of the tunnels as well. And then you can actually walk back in here for free and just take pictures. And then I have two churches that are different. One was um, Eastern Orthodox, and you can just see the different types of architecture. Are, these are the more like showy churches in Bulgaria. Well, in different cities, they had to they had to kind of like keep hidden their churches due to the different rulers they are under. And then here's Plavdiv, which is the culture capital, and it's actually the oldest city as well. So we have some modern architecture on the top, as everybody said, here's McDonald's in here. And then um, this is just somebody's apartment over here. And then underneath, you have all this architecture, all this history, and this is actually a museum where they built around the ruins. And this is the oldest um, church that we found in Plavdiv, and up here is just a hill that's just been here forever, and they just built on top of it but underneath are all these ruins. So we also have the wall that keeps the church in, and these churches are built like houses because 
during the Ottoman era, they were turning the Bulgarians from Christianity to Muslim. So what the Bulgarians do is hide their churches, so that way they can still practice in secret. Just like this is one of the Muslim temples that used to exist. And it is still running today, but on the back it says Christianity is still alive. And then this is one of the houses. This style you don't really see that well um, in today's culture. And then my favorite part are these houses. These are called mushroom houses, and basically um, they don't get a lot of land as we do. We have mansions like in California. Instead, they get this tiny piece of land and just build on top, which is pretty awesome. And then these are the churches involved in. You can see the different architecture here and like the different how they use arches and columns. But this is inside a regular house. So on the outside, you'll see just like a basic house. Think of a worn house with a wall just covering it. But inside, you've got this beautiful architecture that's just been preserved, preserved for centuries. And then this is the agricultural city. And here, they still have ruins preserved beautifully. And they just get these grants from, you know, like the United States to preserve this culture. And here is an actual walkway from the church in here. And then this was also in Star Wars of This is an actual um, running Muslim temple still. So the person would stand up there, and then you still have all this architecture and all these paintings that are still existent today. And all they did was um, preserve it super well, keeping it hidden, and then building it. And then this is a little town. They just have this bell tower that's written about different kinds of houses, and they're built upon this hill, so they preserved it. And then this city was extremely hard. Um, it was raining, it was cold, and you had to climb up this massive hill just to get to this little church up here. Um, you can see the view in the distance. But this is all preserved in the first centuries. And then this was inside that church. So they used a Gothic church style. Um, a lot of people are scared of all this. But you can just see how there's different culture preserved within the architecture. And I think if you should do, I think you should do study abroad. Honestly, it's an amazing experience. You get to see different things. Culture is very important. So is architecture, because architecture tells the story of how these people once were and how they are today, and just how everything's expanded with the time. but I'll try the microphone. Um, so I am a marketing major, just like Zoe. We'll have a little bit of stuff that we'll cover the same, but mostly it's different. And I only have a few slides that have already been covered. When I get to those, I will go ahead and skip over them um, in the interest of time. But just to kind of set the your, your mindset towards communication is what I'm going to kind of focus on, and also a little bit on human behavior. My original report was on um, buying behavior or um, consumer persona, which is totally boring to anyone that's not a marketing major. So I will not share any of that with you. But um, is anyone in here a, a fan of Super Bowl ads? Yeah, you guys have seen the Super Bowl. They're, they're awesome, right? So in 2023, um, to get 30 seconds um, of Super Bowl time, six to seven million dollars for 30 seconds. That averages to approximately $230,000 per second. Why would any company pay that money? I mean, really, their, their whole purpose is to make money. They're for profit, right? Why are you going to pay six or seven million dollars for 30 seconds to communicate your product? Okay, you've got a large audience. On top of so that's just to, to buy the spot. On top of it, you you have putting together your ad, which which obviously is going to come with a lot of expense. But they know companies know they've done the research. They know not only will they make back their six or seven or ten million that they put in to putting the ad together, they will make up a lot more than double. They will make their money back. 
And the reason is a lot of our decisions and our behavior is based on our subconscious, and we're typically unaware of it. That's why we call it the subconscious, but it influences us. And so as I walked around um, Bulgaria, and some of the pictures and things that I'll show kind of have to deal with that about subconsciously what message is being portrayed in different things that we saw. Some of it relates well to America and some of it's very different. Uh-oh, I don't know how to run the remote. Okay, so just to start off, you see some basic symbols. Um, very similar. Right here in the middle, you can see keep a safe distance. We're all so tired of those signs, right? Even in Bulgaria, um, little people with an arrow in between, we all understand that. Um, communication, a water closet, a handicap symbol, um, a female, we all understand that. If you look at the two pictures over here on the side, those are road signs. Doesn't look familiar if you're an American. Is it a stop sign? No? What is it? Okay, don't drive through here. Yeah, like you cannot get out. You gotta know that there is no going through. No, no through street. I might <laughs> Okay, okay. So see, that's kind of different. These other things um, easily recognizable by us. Um, I just wanted to talk real briefly, and I know that um, this is already covered nicely by Zoe, but as you look at KFC and you look up at Subway, one thing that is really important in communication is color. And for a company like a, a Subway or a KFC, when, when their marketing team is working on the messages or um, the graphics that they will use, they will have a, a color code down to the, the, the very code, the size, the font. For example, Google. You can look at anything Google. A, a Google photo um, symbol, icon, anything like that, it's all going to have the exact same color tones to each. It will never vary. The subway actually, it looks like their, their green is off. Can you see that? That's not a normal subway green. Um, it, it's faded. They're having fading problems there. But And you can notice the KFC, the subway, and that's something that's really important in marketing, that, that you're keeping that, that same image up. It's, it's branding, basically. That's how you brand a product. Um, and obviously, it was the same over there as here. I love this. Gelato. That's why you go to Bulgaria. Gelato is great. And I love that how they've marketed it. And, and really, this picture is shrunk down. I couldn't get it to fit on the slide well. But, but these are huge, um, the little containers, the gelato is high piled up on top of these containers, and then it, it's perfectly dripping with stuff. And I see that and I think, a spoon, I'm good, just get me a spoon, I'm happy. <laughs> um, but, but it's the food itself is the, the marketing tool. And then I have this picture of the, the counter next to it, which was so interesting to me because, as you've seen from the pictures, there's beautiful stuff in Bulgaria. There's all kinds of history and culture and art. But this elegant counter um, with all of its shapes and everything is all part of the marketing um, message to the customers. And these two went together. And I thought that they fit so well. And I also thought that they were very different than the rest of the things that we saw in Bulgaria. So very um, something that stood out to me. Okay, another way that they communicate um, this, you would see the signs like this posted obituaries. You would post them at your house on your gate if someone in your family passed away. Um, and then you'd see signs, city centers and towns where people of the community have passed away. But also the bell. And maybe someone, I could not remember the specific rings, but there's a pattern to the rings. And so the people in this small town would hear the bell ring. And if it rang like three times, and that meant an adult male in their community has passed away, or two times was so a female. Does anyone remember the specifics on that? And, and like once might be a child, that a child had passed away. But they use their bell as a way to communicate with each other. I thought that was pretty cool. I love this, and I think America could copy this. I have not seen this before, but obviously the yellow, um, this is all recycling, and you can see 
they were creative. Yellow is, um, I know, the color yellow could, could symbolize lightness, um, happiness, recycle. Everything's going to be better if you recycle, right? And they've used the shape of a bottle. Um, the ventilation in it is even the shape of a bottle. Here you have a heart representing love and happiness, and you put your bottle caps in here and the bottle in the yellow container. Um, up in the corner right here, you can see this particular heart actually had, it looks like a heartbeat on it. Can you guys see the line in this picture? So a heartbeat. So somehow we are symbolizing life. Um, and then we saw a lot of these symbols down on the bottom. Um, rethink, react, reuse. So that's part of their, their logos for um, recycling. I did not like this. I'm not going to interpret it. I'll let you guys come up with your own interpretation of it. Um, but you can see the ball possibly representing the earth. There are broken chains. Um, the, the, I, I put loud next to it because this is, to me, a very loud communication. We have an image that looks like the Statue of Liberty, arrows going through a tail. The tail, I would say, is possibly a serpent, but it has like dragon scales on it. Um, the image is holding a book, and you, can, you can't see it real well in this picture, but the hand that's coming around to hold that book is a, a big claw, almost like a bird's claw hanging onto it. And then you can see a bird is eating out of what would be the torch of the Statue of Liberty. So a lot of communication going on there. Um, Communication is powerful. It influences behavior. Some other cool things um, I love. So we'll start with the lemonade. Here we have, I don't know, you guys can tell me your opinion. Maybe it's different than, than mine. But we have holly, which is Christmas. We have Santa and his reindeer, and we have evergreen trees. And then in the middle of it, lemonade. Lemonade, which for us is, is summer, right? And they have the same seasons that, that we have. I thought it was an interesting mix, but in that restaurant, it's a restaurant called Lemonade, every single window had this exact same, that, that is their branding right there. So interesting mix, um, very different than you'd see in America. Um, this was another restaurant, Opium Garden. I don't know how that restaurant would do in America. Um, words and symbols have different meanings in different cultures. And then we've already seen this picture several times from other people, but I wanted to draw attention to the heart in the coffee cup. Notice the, the little detail of the heart. It's going to make you happy or you love it. Um, also, just above the heart, they have the what I'm going to say is Midas. I don't know if I'm protecting pronouncing that correctly, but also Midas at the bottom. So they, they've double branded here. Um, they're trying to get their symbol out as many times as possible. Um, to get recognition there. Uh, this was a restaurant that we ate at that was delicious. Initially, if you're looking at the, the far left, that's what it, the picture looked like as you came to the restaurant. As you got closer, you can see that the green is actually the top of trees. It's a um, very creative, decorative way um, to create an image for their company. But then when we went inside, you can see behind Keelan's head right here, they had greenery all over in the walls. So unfortunately, I don't speak Bulgarian and a whole bunch of this that I don't understand what, what they're communicating and portraying there. But um, it was very interesting to me. Some of this goes into our trip. And I know we're going long on time, so I'm going to go real fast here. But as far as the airport goes, Initially, when you go into the airport and you're going through all of the um, security and check-in and everything, it was all gray. Everything around you was gray. And then you walk into the bathrooms, the top right picture bathrooms, bright pink and bright red, beautifully well done bathrooms. And the other thing is, once we got through security, you go up an elevator and you're all upstairs. It's beautiful, shops and all kinds of awesome stuff. But the bottom, everything was great. And like I said, um, color, color speaks to us. And it's interesting that they did it that way. It's also interesting, this top left picture, there were tunnels all over. You, you would go in through these tunnels, and, they would and there were tunnels going everywhere. Uh, I, I don't know, interesting. There were small little beds. This was our hotel room. 
<laughs> two little beds and my husband's feet were hanging off the end. He's like, look at me. How are we going to sleep on this? Um, we've already talked. I won't redo all the talk about the, the holiday, the March 1st holiday. But I do want to say real quickly, the male is always dressed in white and, and then the female in red, which I found so interesting because in America, that's not very common that males associate themselves with white. And I did look up um, what that meant. White stands for peace, freedom, and purity. That's pretty interesting that the males associate with that. Red is for courage and their struggle for independence. Um, also, well, I have lots of thoughts about that, but, but it's me trying to think of what that means. Again, I, I had such a little time to experience Bulgaria, but interesting, very different than, than our American culture. Um, just some pictures of Sophia. I'm going to go through a lot of these quickly. I just want... <laughs> This one right here in the middle I love because this is a, an actual tunnel where gladiators would wait to come out in front of the audience or where they would release beasts or the Olympians or whatever was coming to perform. I just really liked that. Um, they had a statement that was briefly talked about earlier, blood brings the people. And so their stadium, they would do blood sports. And also in their theaters that no one mentioned that I remember, they would when they would have plays, someone would actually die, for real. And if it was the main character that died, they would bring in someone from prison and have them right during that scene take the place, and he would die, for real. And, there, and the reason that they would do that is because blood brings the people. It, it's, it's all about money in the end. That's, it brings the people. Maybe you can communicate your message. Sometimes it's not about money. It is sometimes about communicating um, power or communicating... Um, I don't know, political things, all kinds of things. But um, blood brings the people, and so even in the theater, they, they would have real deaths. Trying hard to do nothing. My husband and I went and picked up some pizza one day, and we were walking with it. And all of a sudden, we stopped and realized we were the only person walking and eating. No one does that. They, they sit, and they totally relax. And I just thought, oh, we're so American. But they had these beautiful benches everywhere, which made it very inviting. Here's the little shops that Zoe talked about, little basement shops. And one thing about that, they said as soon as the communism ended in 1990, people were so happy that they were finally free to do something, and there was not enough shop space. So they went to these basements, and they cut out the brick, and they put in little windows and started selling their wares. It was the first time that they could get out and, and try to do things for themselves. Um, the other thing is, one of the people that we talked to, he just said, there's a big division in Bulgaria of people who really liked communism and are sad it's gone, and, and those that are happy that it's gone. And he said, the people who are sad it's gone really like the nostalgia. I was so shocked by that, nostalgia. I, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, when there's communist rule, you have to be nice to everybody. That, that's just part of they expected everyone to be nice, and everyone was nice to each other. And now people are free to be rude if they want. And, and you have this older generation of people that are used to nice people everywhere, and, and now it's not always that way. Um, so that's an interesting change. They're still developing and changing a lot there. Like we said, we saw so many beautiful things about Bulgaria. Bulgaria is, is in a state of change, in, in my opinion, right now. Um, on the communism front, anyways, the change from that. Okay, I had to put the raspberry lemonade. When you order a raspberry lemonade, this is what you get, like a, a whole container, and it's the most delicious stuff. And then they give you really good food, and so if you want to gain weight, you should go there. The beautiful cities. Um, why study abroad real quick? The people, um, like some others have said, my husband and I have kept in contact with a few people we met from over there, which is sweet. Um, the beauty, the gelato, that's a good reason to go. Um, the food was awesome. <laughs> um, exercise, we've already talked about that. <laughs> we walked and we walked. Um, the friends, and this is the best reason, I think, to go study abroad. My sister told me she has her master's degree, and after she got it, she said, I finally figured out why your professor 
ha all your professors ask you to do this exercise and that exercise, whatever, she said, what they're really teaching you is how to learn the things that you don't know that you don't know. Not the things that you know you don't know, but the things that you don't even know you don't know. And that, that's why your professors make you do all these things. And so you don't know what you don't know, and studying abroad is a great way to learn. Let's thank our speakers one more time for the The uh, information that you received about Bulgaria, and hopefully you would want to go to a study abroad in Bulgaria or anywhere else in the world. And um, I would like to thank, yes, Dr. Medor for helping me organize this whole event and uh, going through the disappointment of not going to Peru, but it was. I'm not safe there. And I really hope that you enjoyed, guys, your time in Bulgaria and you are ready to go. <laughs> Thank you.